So go ahead at this point and please open your Bibles with me to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 21. Now we've noted the last couple of weeks that what we're doing here is we are uh, entering in to the last week of Jesus' life. How would you feel if someone told you you got one week? You got one week to live. This is your last week starting today. How would you live each and every day? Some would say, man, I'll be living that on my knees, right? Some would say, I'm just going to go out and have a blast. Or, you know, I'm going to try to get a whole lifetime of memories in in one week. Or, or I'm going to take this last week that I have and I'm going to commit it to serving God with all my heart. And that's exactly what Jesus has done. He could have made a lot of different choices during this last week of his life. But the beautiful thing about that is he chose us. He chose the people that were around him to continue ministering, teaching, healing, until the very moment in which he was arrested. So we saw on Sunday of the last week of his life that he came to Jerusalem on the cult of a donkey, the triumphant entry, if you will, or Palm Sunday. And uh, this was, of course, I might add, this is a very important thing, too. This was the very first time that Jesus ever allowed worship for people to literally worship him as the Messiah openly. This was the first time. And, of course, we know on Monday, Jesus went in and cleansed the temple of all the money changers and the profiteers that were... um, Ripping the people off. We talked about that last week. And this morning we're going to be taking a couple of stories that took place on Tuesday. So we find every morning it would appear that Jesus is coming back into Jerusalem, back to the temple to do his work there. You know, the book of Hebrews is, um, is, well, it's called a book of Hebrews because it was written to the Hebrews. It was written to the Jews, and the reason it was written was to prove to the Jewish people that Jesus was the Messiah that they had been waiting for all this time. But in the book of Hebrews, it tells us that Jesus has become our high priest. He's the one that stands before you and the Father. He's the one that paid the price. He's the one who is an advocate, if you will, between us and his Father. Literally, that word would mean a defense attorney for us. He stands in our place before the Father. And when the Father finds us covered in in the blood of his Son, we find ourselves cleansed from all sin, past, present, future. And it makes us acceptable in his sight. That's a beautiful thing, because I hope you realize this morning that there's nothing else in the universe that can make you acceptable in God's sight other than the blood of Jesus Christ. And even at this time in his life, we have seen he is a human being. He has all the feelings of a human. He loves people. He gets hungry. He gets tired. He gets a little burned out sometimes, and he needs to kind of retreat to be alone with his father and get rejuvenated, if you will, just like you and me need to do. All of the things the Bible tells us that we experienced, he himself experienced that also. So here we find him in the last week of his life, For the third time now, coming into the temple on Tuesday morning. And we're going to pick up our story in verse 21 of chapter 21. Um, I'm sorry, verse 23. 
Verse 23, it says, Now when he came into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people confronted him as he was teaching. And they said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? They want to know, where did the authority for you to come in here and disrupt our little scheme that we have? And to disrupt our power play that we have over these people. Who gave you the authority? Because in their mind, they were the authority. Now, we know that um, in, in the Christian church, um, authority is passed down by the laying on of hands. And so we confer the authority of God onto a man or a woman by the laying on of hands and, and a blessing when we find that person who is committed and dedicating their life to the service of God. And maybe they want to serve in full-time ministry or as a missionary or, or whatever it might be to give them that authority. You know, there's been folks who have asked me, where do you get your authority? Did the Pope lay hands on you? Did the president of Calvary Chapel lay hands on you? Well, you know, we don't have a president of Calvary Chapel. But I was had my hand, hands were laid on me by my pastor who mentored me, who saw something in me and the Lord spoke to him and said, kick him out of this church and send him to Sheridan. The authority that you have is the same authority. The authority that you have, Jesus said, if you have faith, you can move mountains. You can change the world by prayer. That's the kind of authority that we've all been given. And, you know, moving mountains, you could think is, is that literal? I've never really seen a mountain moved. Well, you know what? I've seen a lot of people who have mountains in their lives. Mountains of unforgiveness, mountains of sin. And I've seen God move those mountains and change their lives. And you know, it's a beautiful thing when we understand that. And so these authority guys here, they're asking Jesus, what makes you think that you can come in here and turn everything upside down? And, and you're teaching these people. Isn't that our job to teach the people? Obviously, they were failing at their job. You know, that's one of the, I think one of the most important things in church is good, solid Bible teaching. I think that that's the thing that feeds us, educates us, encourages us, and strengthens us to do God's work. Could you imagine if we were trying to do this without the Word of God? We'd be trying to figure it out along the way. It'd be a mess, wouldn't it? We'd have everybody thinking, well, my opinion is this, and here's another opinion over here, and, you know, we would never have any sort of uh, firm compass that we could go by. But we have God's Word. And when Jesus was on the earth, He was God's Word in living form. And so what He spoke was directly from God. That's the authority that Jesus had. And they didn't like the way he taught because people actually listened. <laughs> people actually learned and grew from the things that Jesus taught. And, you know, we've been through Matthew. There's nothing really complicated in here, right? I mean, we have little things like, you must become a child if you want to get into the kingdom of heaven. And you ponder that for a little bit, and you think, that's not really that complicated. And it will be silly for me to stand here and tell you, yeah, you need to regress in your maturity level down to being a little squabbling little baby. But that's not what Jesus was talking about, is it? He was talking about trusting in our Heavenly Father, trusting in the work of Christ, just like a little child would trust in his good, good Father. We sang about him this morning. So here's Jesus speaking and these priests and these elders who are representative of the Sanhedrin who were actually the ruling authority uh, in the temple there in the Jewish world. 
And they, and they really did believe that they were the final authority on these issues. And, uh, of course, they were among the same people who are now conspiring and planning on his demise, his betrayal, and his execution. So these are not his allies. You know, it's really sad when God calls a person to ministry, and you would think that he would just be surrounded by so many great allies to help and support. But you know, there are those who dissent also. There are those who aren't your friends in a sense. Don't turn your back, right? And it's true, it does happen. Not very often, but sometimes it does happen. Now, we read many times that the multitudes, they loved Jesus. They loved being around him. But there was that one little select group of people, the ones who had ulterior motives. And believe it or not, sometimes those kind of people creep into churches too. They have ulterior motives. Maybe they don't have a heart of love like the congregation should. Maybe they're out to be critical and attack. Maybe they're trying to take over. Who knows what their motives might be? We know this morning that these men had a specific motive, and that was to silence this man once and for all. What authority are you doing this by? So they want an answer, but, you know, Jesus, Jesus is very, very wise. Jesus gives them an answer here, which is not really an answer. It becomes a question. So, in uh, verse 24, Jesus said, I also will ask you one thing. Which of you tell me? Which, if you tell me, I likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. Here's the question. The baptism of John. Where was it from? Was it from heaven or was it from men? Did God ordain and anoint and appoint John the Baptist from days of old, eternity past, to be the forerunner of the Messiah, to be the one to pronounce repentance for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and to baptize people? Yes, but that's the question he's asking. And so they're reasoning among themselves. One of the other versions says they got together and had a little discussion about this question. How are we going to ask this answer the question that he has posed to us today? If we say that his baptism and his ministry was from heaven, then he will say, then why didn't you believe in him? Logical answer. And then they're thinking, but if we say that his ministry was just from men or from the flesh or maybe it was just John's idea, if we say something like that, we fear the people. Because they count John as a prophet. They were, they, they were collapsed, if you will, under fear and pressure from the people, from the multitudes. It's an amazing thing when you have leadership that people loathe. When you have someone who's in leadership that does not have the heart that, that they should have for that particular leadership. We see it all the time, especially in our culture today. There are leaders that have no business being leaders because their motives are totally evil. These men are so afraid of how they're going to look in front of the people, they want to keep the peace. They don't want to stir things up. You know, we don't want to make the Romans angry at us because now they're going to start taking privileges away from us again. We've got to keep the peace. It's real important, even at the cost of truth. We don't want to shake things up just because of truth, do we? Absolutely not. So as they discuss this, they tell Jesus, they said, we don't know. We don't know. Now, that's a lie. They did know. They had seen it over and over and over and over again. They knew. You know, a better answer would have been, we just don't feel like we want to tell you. That would have been an honest answer, right? But no, they chose to lie. They said, we're not going to answer your question. 
So Jesus in turn said, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. It's a very interesting conversation that they're having here. You know, there are some people I know you may have met in your life that you can tell them over and over and over again about the love of God. You can share your testimony with them about how God has changed your life. You can talk to them about the glorious gospel of salvation. And you can talk until you're blue in the face and it just falls to the ground. It's like going out and talking to a tree. They just don't get it. Well, these guys couldn't get it either. It's as though their eyes are closed. It's as though they're spiritually blind. And that is a terrible epidemic in our culture today, spiritual blindness. Do you have family that you pray for that doesn't know the Lord? Family that's living in rebellion? Family that really doesn't care about God? You know the reason that they're that way is because they're blinded. That's what the Bible says. Their eyes have been blinded. They've been deceived by Satan, by the devil, by the things of the world, by the latest talk topics that are going around. They're deceived. They're blind. They cannot see. And we pray and we pray and we pray and nothing seems to change. You know, I would just say, not that this is actually a 100% cure for the problem, but I would say I want to pray for my loved one that God would bind the work of Satan in their life, that he would take his hands off of them so that their eyes can be opened, so that they can see the truth. Because as long as he's got his blinders over their eyes, they will never see it. And so we ask the Father, we ask the Holy Spirit, we ask... Jesus, Lord, bind that enemy in their life. Give them that opportunity to see the truth. These guys have the same opportunity, but they reject it. Once again, they all have the free will to reject what they would wish to reject and accept what they want. In John chapter 6, verses 38 through 40, I love this little passage I'm going to read it from the NIV. It says, I've come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. You want to know who I am, he said? You want to know where I get my authority? Well, I come down from heaven. Where did you come from? Well, my mother's womb, right? Not me. I came down from heaven. And guess what? I've been around from everlasting to everlasting, forever and ever. I have no beginning and I have no end. And I have come down from heaven not to do my will. In other words, not to do my will in the flesh. Sometimes we have to set our will aside. I know that there are times when we want to get in and fix something or we want to clean something up. But really, that's not our wheelhouse. God's got us doing something else over here that he wants us to focus on. There's a lot of wrongs. There's a lot of injustice that we will never, ever be able to fix. And I think Jesus is saying, you know, really, as a man, as a human being, if I had my will, yeah, I'd wipe out these Romans and establish the kingdom, and it'd be so much easier to do it that way. But that's not the plan of my father. My father has a plan. So I didn't come to do his will, but to do his will. And this is the will of him who sent me. I love this. That I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my father's will is that everyone who looks to the son and believes in him shall have eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. You going to raise yourself? Is your husband going to call your heavenly name and raise you from the grave? Absolutely not. I tell you what, there's a humongo church out there that teaches that. I felt bad for my mom because she was part of that organization, you know. And then, of course, when I was a little boy, mom and dad split up and dad got remarried and she got remarried. And you know how life goes, right? And I'm thinking about that, and I'm thinking... 
So will my dad call my mom up out of the grave? What if he doesn't? She'll be in the grave forever. I am so glad that that call isn't his. Huh? I'm glad that that call is the Father, God, the Father's call. He will raise us up at the last day. And then in chapter 24 of the Gospel of John, it said the Jews gathered around him and they were asking him, how long are you going to keep us in suspense? (laughs) We want you to be clear Quit beating around the bush. Tell us plainly if you're the Christ. And Jesus said to them, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me, but you do not believe, because you are not my sheep. Whew, that's a blow, huh? My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, and no one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. And the Jews picked up stones to stone him. And Jesus said to them, I have shown you many great miracles from the Father, for which of these Do you stone me? We're not stoning you for any of these, replied the Jews, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. They didn't like that. They picked up stones to stone him. By what authority are you doing these things? Well, John the Baptist, I'll tell you, he was... A very interesting fellow, much different than Jesus, totally different than Jesus. He was a recluse. He lived out in the middle of the wilderness. He ate bugs. I don't know about that one. Eating bugs is kind of a new thing out there today, though, isn't it? You can buy bug burgers and all different kinds of things out there. I think I'll stick with the cow and the elk and all that stuff. So they tell Jesus, we don't know. They got caught, didn't they? Jesus said, if you can't tell me the answer, then I'm not going to answer your question. It won't do me any good to answer your question because you won't believe the answer I give you anyway. Why should I waste my breath? You're spiritual, supposedly, leaders. You're you're." Church leaders, in a sense. And you cannot tell the Messiah when you see him. I'm not going to waste my breath. And so Jesus, after this, um, in verse 28, Jesus said to them, but what do you think? And he's going to tell a parable. A man had two sons, and he came to the first, and he said, Son, go to work today in my vineyard. And he answered, and he said, I will not. But afterward, he regretted it, and he went. And then he came to the second son, and he said, Likewise. And he answered, and he said, I will go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? And they said to him, well, the first, Jesus says to them, assuredly, I say to you that tax collectors and harlots will enter the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But tax collectors and harlots believed him. And when you saw it, you did not afterwards relent and believe in him. You had an opportunity to reach out and embrace God's plan and God's work, but you would not. You talk a real good talk. You're in the synagogue every Sunday, but you're not doing the Father's work. Whereas these harlots and these tax collectors and these common people, they forsook everything for the Lord much like you and I. 
which of the ones did the Father's will? He sends both of them into the vineyard. And, you know, it's interesting, this, this, uh, this, this vineyard. Um, many, many times a wealthy individual would buy property and buy a vineyard or plant a vineyard, and, and he would build all the facility needed uh, to have a wine press and all, and then he would rent it out. And then he would leave and he would go about his business in whatever area that he might be doing business. And every year he would come in and he would collect the profit and pay the workers uh, at the wine press, at the vineyard. It's a very common thing. And so we have this picture here of the owner of the vineyards saying, Son, I want you to go out and work. Now, there's a lot of people that I've heard over the years tell me, I've been going to church all my life. Well, that's cool, but do you know Jesus? You've been going to church all your life, but have you really made a commitment to him? Are you really born again, or are you just pretending? Maybe you got a dual, double life thing going on. Maybe you're one way on Sunday and totally different as soon as you get out the doors, right? I'm free. I can live the way I want for six more days, right? Even those like the tax collector, like the harlots, they experienced life-changing power when they put their trust in the Lord. They were no longer tax collectors. They were no longer harlots. They were men and women of God. They were disciples of Jesus. They forsook. So this is the son who at first, like you and I in in our life, this son at first said, nah, I don't really want anything to do with that. I've heard this one a hundred times at least. I got... Raised in Sunday school, and I got it crammed down my throat as a child, and I don't want anything to do with it. There's just a bunch of hypocrites in that place, right? And I always feel like saying, well, there's room for one more. Come on in, right? And then there's those that profess to have faith, but they don't live that way. They're the ones that said, yes, Father, I'll go out and work in your vineyard. And they never did. They made a commitment, but they didn't live up to their commitment. And this is what Jesus is talking about. Jesus has the authority because he had the right as the Messiah and the Savior of the world. Whereas these other people, the chief priests and the elders who were supposed to be the ones who were leading the people, they did not repent of their sin. They did not believe the message of John about the Messiah. They were hardened in their self-righteous pride and their calloused hearts. That's why people don't like to go to church. I've actually had people come to me and say, you know what, Pastor? I got enough problems in my life without going in a bunch among a bunch of people who are a bunch of cop, a bunch of uh, hypocrites and, and uh, condemning people. Well, I don't blame them. I wouldn't want to either, would you? We all got a burden to carry. We all got our cross to bear. Why would we want to step in into an environment where it's much worse? I wouldn't want to do that either. I can understand that. But that's not who Jesus is. That's the important thing for us to know this morning. You know, not every judge is a good judge. Not every teacher is a good teacher. So what do we do? Get rid of all the judges and all the teachers because a few of them aren't good? Well, that's silly. Of course not. You know, that'd be like me saying, well, I got hurt by a woman, and so I hate all women. I've heard that one on both sides. That is just silly to say that, well, I was in a bummer church with a bunch of bummer people because they had a bummer leader And so that means all churches are bad. Oh, man. 
What a ripoff. What a lie from the enemy himself. To keep people out of church, to keep them away from being able to gather together, love on each other, feel safe. Isn't that why we're here? That's what attracts us to the Lord Jesus Christ. We're either like that first son who said, I'm not going to go, but then we repent. We change our life of disobedience and we give our hearts to God. We repent. We have a change of mind. Our lifestyle's different. And we did go to work in the Father's vineyard or the other son. Oh, yes, God. But doggone it, I got too many things on, on my plate as it is. You come to church, but your heart's far from God. You act religious, but you don't have a relationship with Jesus. You're confronted with truth, but you've never really faced it. You've never really turned to God. And you have seen what God has done in other people's lives, but still they refuse to repent. It's a very, very sad story. But that's the story of life, isn't it? That's the way life is. And then when we get to verse 33, he tells us another parable. And it's kind of similar to the one we just read with a little bit of a twist to it. In verse 33, he said, here another parable. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and he set a hedge around it. He dug a wine press in it and he built a tower. And he leased it to the vine dressers and then he went into a far country. Now when vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the vine dressers that they might receive its fruit. And the vine dressers took his, sis, his servants and they beat one, they killed one, and they stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first and they did likewise to them. And then last of all, he sends his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the vine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and seize his inheritance. So they took him and they cast him out of the vineyard and they killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? And they said to him, he will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to another vine dresser who will render to him the fruit in their season. And Jesus said to them, Have you ever read in the scriptures that the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? And this was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and it will be given to a nation bearing the fruit of it. And whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. Now when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived, duh, that he was speaking about them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. Once again, fear of the multitude. Once again, we find Jesus speaking to these specific group of people. This landowner. You know, well, like I said earlier, it was not uncommon for a landowner to do this. And it tells us exactly what he did to get the business up and running. Plants the vineyard, builds a wall, Puts in a wine press and a watchtower. The place is all ready to go. And it includes a vat also. So the press, the wine press, if you will, would usually be cut out of the side of a hill. And all the grapes would be placed in there. And then people would go in there and stomp on them. I just got a visual of Lucy <clears throat> wow, that was funny, wasn't it? <clears throat> that was great. 
So they would go in there and they would stomp on these grapes and as the juice would come out, it would fall down into the vat below. And this is how they did it. And it was a business. And uh, so he rents out this place. It's already got all the fixings. It's all set up to go. All they have to do is go in and operate it. All they have to do is be people of character and honesty. And they're going to profit and they're going to do well. Because the landowner has given them everything they need to be successful. And guess what? The Father has given us everything we need to be successful. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us he's given us everything that we need to live godly lives in Christ Jesus. Everything. All we have to do is go to work. All we have to do is use the tools that he's already given us. And so he rents out the vineyard. And, of course, it would, uh, the rent would be paid by the proceeds, proceeds from, the, from the business, and that's cool. But then he sends his servants to go and collect at the end of the, servant, uh, the, the uh, harvest time. So this verse tells us that there were three servants that were sent. One was killed. One was beaten. And the other one was stoned. Now, the word actually, the Greek word interesting here for beaten is the word fillet. So they were tortured. They were filleted. Their skin cut off of them. A very, very painful way to be tortured. Another one was uh, stoned, but obviously survived. And then the other one was literally killed. And so he sends more servants, and the same thing happened to them. And he gets to this point where he says, you know what? Maybe I'm going to send my son. They, you know what? I know that they will respect my son. But when they saw the son, they were afraid. They were threatened. Their security of having the vineyard and all the profits to themselves was in jeopardy. And so what did they choose to do? Well, let's just take out the son. I mean, you know, father's far, far away. He'll never know. And so what do they do? They take the son, and they drag him out, and they kill him. Can you imagine this kind of response? They finally kill the owner's son, thinking now that they could have the whole vineyard to themselves. And after he tells the story, he asks the question. He said, when the owner of vineyard comes, what's he going to do to these tenants? How's he going to react to what they've done to his son and to his workers, his messengers, if you will. And they give a great answer. They're going to be in big trouble. He'll take that vineyard away from them, and he'll give it to another group of people who will care for it and prosper it and do the right thing with it. And then he says something very, very interesting to them. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone This is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. He is quoting uh, from a psalm, and it was originally spoken of David, but as in many, many psalms and prophetic utterances in the Old Testament, they may have a dual meaning. On one hand, they might be speaking about something in the present tense, David was the stone that was rejected, but then he eventually became the king, the cornerstone. And along with that immediate answer to it would be a future answer that has not yet come to pass. And that future stone was Jesus. This was taken from Psalm 118, verses 22 and 23. The servants who came to collect the rent... In our story, were Old Testament prophets. And they were sent by God, or the owner of the vineyard, if you will, to call people to repentance. Now, I'll tell you, being a prophet in the Old Testament, (laughs) that was not a good career move. Okay? There weren't many benefits to that. It wasn't a long-term ministry. As a matter of fact, every single one of them was ignored, tortured, mocked, and killed, all of them, all the way up until John, 
who was literally the very last Old Testament prophet. And they killed him. Just like they killed all of the others. And finally, the son who was sent is Jesus himself. He was sent to the vineyard, to those who were put in charge. And who was it put in charge of the vineyard? It was the Jewish people. It was the Jewish leaders. He was, they were God's people. God set them apart all the way back from the days of Abraham to be a nation set aside just for him. To be a nation through which the bloodline of the Messiah would come. There's a story of when they were building the temple and, you know, all of the stones from the temple were carved in a quarry that was quite some distance away from the building site. There was to be no sounds of hammers or saws or anything like that on the temple grounds during construction. It was very, very quiet. So everything was cut, hewn, marked, and sent to the construction site to be put together like a big model. Everything was pre-done. All he had to do was assemble it. And as they're assembling the building and they're looking around for stone number 322, they find this other stone, different from all of the other stones. It's shaped different, and they can't figure out what its purpose is. It must be a manufacturer flaw. So let's just kick this stone over the edge. Well, we're not going to need it. And then as they complete, they get close to completing the construction, they find out, hey, where's that cornerstone at that we were supposed to place here in this spot? And someone said, oh, look, it's laying down there in the junk pile. We rejected that stone. And so they brought it back up and they come to find out that that stone was specially cut to be the cornerstone or the capstone, if you will. A capstone is that stone in the middle of an arch that holds it all together, and without it, the arch will collapse. Jesus is that stone. And it says, this is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. So therefore, guess what, guys? The kingdom is going to be taken from you, and this is a prophetic utterance by Jesus. The kingdom's going to be taken from you and given to the Gentiles. It's going to be given to those people that you loathe, those people that you think you're better than, the ones that you think that God's going to use for fuel for the fires of hell. They're going to get the blessing. They're going to receive the kingdom and inherit the vineyard. Peter said this in his... uh, In his teaching in Acts chapter 4, he said, Know this, you and all the people of Israel, that's who he's talking to, the Jews, it's by the, now he had just got done healing somebody, Peter did. Uh, He said, uh, it's by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who you crucified, but who God raised from the dead, that this man is standing before you healed. He, Jesus, is the stone that the builders rejected, but he's become the capstone, and salvation is found in no one else. Let me say that again. These are Peter's words inspired by the Holy Spirit. Salvation is found in no one else. How do you feel about that this morning? Some of you I know really well. Some of you I don't. So it's a good question. Where are you with this this morning? Is there another way in your mind? Do you think that there's more than one way to get to heaven? No, there's only one way. Now, I'm pretty sure that if Peter, the Holy Spirit spoke to Peter, and there was another way to do it, he would have mentioned it. I'm sure that Jesus would have mentioned it. But he didn't. He said, as a matter of fact, he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And there's no other way for you to get to the Father but through me. Does anybody not understand that? And why is it that we struggle with that so much? So many people do. And we will struggle with that until we finally come to that place in our lives where we surrender once and for all completely, totally to the Lord. 
I want to be part of God's building, don't you? I want to be part of God's kingdom. When I get to heaven with you and we're all up there together, it'll be so fun to reminisce about these days, won't it? You remember those days? I'm not going to say the good old days because these are the good days now that will last forever and ever. I heard somebody the other day tell me, I can't wait to die. I do. I just want to go to heaven, man. I'm so tired of this crummy world I live in. Well, I get tired of this crummy world, too, and it's very frustrating sometimes. But, you know, it came to me as he was telling me that. I thought, you know, this is a one-way trip through this life. And how many of you know that it flies by? Huh? I can't believe for the life of me that I got a 41-year-old son. How can that be? I'm still 22. I don't get it. Life is going by so quick, and before we know it, we're on the other end. And then we start thinking about, oh my gosh, I only have a few days left. I better better make the most of it, right? We're only passing through here one time, you guys. Thank God. But you're going to be in heaven with the Lord forever and ever, and ever, and ever, never ending in the presence of God. And so when I look at that and I compare those two things, this little speck in time compared to eternity, I feel like the Spirit's telling me, I want you to make the most of this speck. I want you to live it to the most. I want you to fulfill my will in your life in this little speck of time because you're never coming back this way again. Nurture your relationships, love your children, be people of integrity, make good choices, do the right thing, stand up for your morals and your values, defend the word of God during this little speck of time because people's eternal destiny depends upon it. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. And it's going to pass very, very quickly. They're going to take away the kingdom from the Jews. You know what happened. You know the story, most of you. You know that 70 A.D. when Jerusalem fell to Rome and the temple was destroyed and burnt down and and robbed and pillaged and the Jewish people were tortured. They almost became an unpeople. It was so bad. They almost went into extinction. And it wasn't the first time. It's like the third time, fourth time. But you know what? God continues to love those people. He continues to say, there's going to be a day when I'm going to establish my kingdom with my people, Israel. Some people say, oh, no, no, no. God's done with Israel. The church is Israel. It's not. They call that replacement theology. Don't let anybody ever tell you that, okay? We are the bride of Christ. We are not Israel. We're not Jewish. We're Gentiles. But we're very, very special and we're very unique in God's eyes. He doesn't love them any more than he loves us. He loves us the same. But we have this beautiful distinction this morning of being the bride of Christ. Jewish people don't get that distinction. But they are God's chosen people. And there will be that day when he will reunite them all and they will all come back together and they will recognize Jesus for the Messiah that he is. They will look at him and say, this is the guy that we pierced. We were so blind. And then I want to finish with this one little passage right here, which I think is pretty important. Whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. Let me ask you a question this morning. Have you tripped over Jesus? Have you scuffed yourself up a little bit here and there? Maybe you're walking along, you didn't see the cornerstone, and you hit it, and you fell over into the ground, you got scuffed up, and you got up, and then you went your way. But nothing changed. You're still the same person. Jesus says that's one scenario. But here's the other scenario. If that stone falls on you, 
You'll be ground to powder. Now, the question this morning is, do I want to be ground to powder? Or do I want to maybe trip over the stone, get scuffed up a little bit, and surrender my life to him? Brokenness, you guys. That's what happens when we come to the cross. When we come to the cross and we understand what the cross is, we are broken. And if you're not broken, you will be. Because it's part of the process. But God forbid that we should be ground to powder when we're not good for anything but to be thrown off to the side. God has plans for us. The Jews were offended by Jesus. They stumbled, and they're going to be ground to powder. Very sad, very sad ending for some of those. Very sad ending for many, many Gentiles who refused to believe. And these Pharisees, you got to hand it to them. They're a bunch of real geniuses. When the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that they were taught he was speaking about them. Really? Duh. And he's also talking about those today, even here or in the world, that reject Christ. I want the worship team to come on back up. I've kept you a few minutes longer than I intended to here this morning. But I felt like that this very verse in verse 44 was really important for us to look at. Maybe you're here this morning and you're tripping all over the place. Maybe you're feeling like you're getting ground to powder. Maybe you feel like you need prayer. And I want to encourage you this morning, if you need prayer, if you need to tighten your relationship with the Lord, or maybe initiate a brand new relationship with the Lord, you have an opportunity to do that before you leave here today. You can make it right with God, but I'll tell you what you have to do. You have to set your pride to the side for a moment. You have to get up out of your seat, and you have to ask for prayer. It's okay. I ask for prayer all the time. And we've got a couple wonderful folks over here that want to pray with you. So if you want to see them after, during those last two songs, whatever it might be, before you get out of the door, if you need prayer, get prayer. We don't charge for it. It's free. The only thing you have to pay is a little tiny bit of humility, right? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you. Lord, that you have given us opportunity this morning to understand some of these things that Jesus was going through. And we know, God, that you, the Father, are still in charge. You're still the owner of the vineyard. And you're looking for workers in the vineyard who would come and and fulfill your plan for their lives. And we thank you so much for your son who came and instructed us and showed us the way, showed us the way to life by denying ourselves, by denying our own agenda, by denying that self-centered life and stepping into the freedom of Christ-centered life. I want to pray for anybody in this room this morning, Lord, who might be kind of wrestling with that, kind of not too sure where they stand, that, Lord, you would open their eyes, that you would reveal yourself by your Holy Spirit to them. Awaken them, Lord. Awaken us. Give us a sense of urgency today as we know that the time is short. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Sparrow's not worried about tomorrow or the troubles to come. Willie's not thinking about the seasons, the drought or the flood. Tree that's planted by the water isn't phased by the fire. So why should I? You take good care of me You take good care of me You know what I need Before I even ask a thing You hold me in your hands With the kindness
kiss that never ends. I'm carried in your love, no matter what the future brings. You take good care of me. The sun's not worried about the winter, cause soon it will pass. The light's not thinking about the darkness or the shadow. You take good care of me. You take good care of me. You know what I need before I even ask a thing. You hold me in your hands with a kindness that never ends. I'm carried in your love no matter what the future brings. You take good care. your kindness I know there's got to be more but I can't get past your goodness I know there must be more but I can't get past your kindness I know there's got to be more but I can't get past your goodness you take good care of me you take good care of me
sing. 